Our service of Holy Eucharist begins in your prayer books on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. <clears throat> Our first reading is from Mark. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 98. We will read it responsively by half verse. Sing to the Lord a new song. With his right hand and his holy arm, the Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He remembers his mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the voice of song. With trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it. The lands and those who dwell therein. 
Let the rivers clap their hands. And let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord when he comes to judge the earth. In righteousness shall he judge the world. And the peoples with equity. <clears throat> Our second reading is from Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. The word of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Lord Jesus Christ. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> well, we are bringing the church year to a close at the end of the season after Pentecost, and the church focuses on the end times. We do this every year at this time. The apocalypse makes a picture frame around the Christian year. Today's readings convey a sense of urgency that is important to incorporate into our modern spirituality. For about, after, oh, for about the last 50 years, and probably a little longer, the Church has been focusing our attention and proclamation on God as a loving, kind, and gentle parent. And that is true. God is love. And where true love is, God himself is there. This is true, but it is also not the only story. And without the apocalyptic readings, some of us risk being lulled into a kind of a happy religious trance. A little sleepy sometimes. Well, if you were a little bit asleep, those readings from Malachi and Luke should wake you up out of that trance. The great and terrible day of the Lord is clearly told. Images of destruction. The wicked burn as stubble in a field. There is tremendous upheaval. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Earthquakes famines, plagues, and great portents from heaven. As I was reading it, I thought, this kind of sounds like the age we are in. Wildfires unchecked in the West, unseasonably hot weather, global climate change, war once again in the Eastern Front in Europe, hurricanes that devastated Florida and just this week whipped through with some tornado warnings. It sounds modern, all of our portents, but it has sounded this same way to every age that has heard these words of scripture. Imagine living during the time of the First World War, the war to end all wars, only it didn't. Those who lived in a nuclear age, I think one of you posted something funny on Facebook about the child's death be desk being hidden under to protect yourself from a nuclear bomb. I asked if it came with a gun stuck underneath. And imagine living back 
in the years of the plague and the Black Death. If you read people's journals then, they were 100% certain that those were the end times. And who could blame them? For the population of Europe and Asia was decimated. So for those people who read these apocalyptic warnings, sometimes they are tempted to leave everything behind in the certainty of the end times, family possessions and property, and ascend high on a mountain to meet God. Those end times are surely coming down on them. But they have learned what we all have learned over time. The world never ends in the way we anticipate because these apocalyptic readings never seem to be portents of the way history actually plays out, I think some of us have learned over time to ignore them altogether, much as we ignore that person on the street corner walking back and forth with a piece of cardboard, kind of talking to himself or whatever car will whiz by. The end is near. Well, that's just a crazy person. And what do you expect? But these kinds of readings can enhance our Christian spirituality. St. Paul gives us insight into this in today's letter to the church in Thessalonica. If you read both of St. Paul's letters, and I encourage you to read them and more, you will learn that today's letter is part of a bigger picture, a larger conversation he is having with the church. Paul was writing compellingly to the church about the second coming of Christ and the final judgment of the world. It is a thoughtful scripture choice for this time of the church year because we are getting ready to go into Advent. In Advent, we prepare and honor the coming of the Christ child four weeks later at Christmas. We remember this in the past. Some of us get to celebrating a little too early with the happy Christmas carols while the church says, we're still in Advent. And the church says this over and over again because Advent also, while it is the celebration, the preparation for the celebration of something that happened 2,000 years ago, the church is still preparing for the second coming of Christ. And that colors the way we look at Advent and the readings. And we start with John the Baptist, another crazy man walking back and forth. In his first letter, Paul wrote, I do not need to write you about the time or the date when all this will happen. You surely know that the Lord's return will be as a thief coming in the night. People will think they are safe and secure but destruction will suddenly strike them like the pains of a woman about to give birth, and they won't escape. Apparently, people reacted to Paul's message, thinking that the imminence of the Lord's return excused them from doing any kind of work at all. They became, as Paul describes them in today's passage, mere busybodies, not doing any work. It was obviously a misunderstanding of Paul's way of thinking. Rather than doing nothing and sitting around waiting for the final judgment, Paul offers in those letters an example of his own life and ministry. And he was not a man to sit around in a dazed and happy state about being a follower of Christ. Paul himself worked hard for the spread of the gospel. He converted many people to Christianity. He formed disciples. He went about teaching and preaching, and while he was doing all of this, he continued to be a tent maker. Every convert he made was a challenge to the status quo. It appears that to Paul, the best way to prepare for upheaval and God's judgment is to hurry the process along. Building up the kingdom of God challenged the dominance of all those other earthly kingdoms. Paul agitated the church, 
for a renewed vision of humanity, a way of inviting us to share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Central to Christ's glory is the fact that it does not share in the glory of any earthly kingdom. And to claim Jesus as Lord questioned the lordship of every emperor and every idol that we would put in God's place. Paul was working to equip the people of his generation to stand over and against the arrogant claims of earthly rulers, against the way that their lives were, and to claim citizenship instead in a larger and all-encompassing realm of God's love. To be different in the world, Paul taught, means that we must cultivate those things that are truly important and get our priorities in order. Paul stresses not giving up on the work of your day-to-day -day life when one is not sure about the future. It is this very sense of being uncertain that can help us figure out what is most important. And in doing that, it gives us a sense of urgency that informs the way we sort out our true and deep spiritual needs as individuals as well as a church. What is unnecessary and what is trivial? What is essential to being church? What is essential to being Christian and a follower of Christ? Set your priorities and get that stuff straight, Paul tells us. Christian spirituality, it has been said, is about prioritizing our loves. Love of God and love of neighbor and love of our enemies. The demands of love require our attention and our very lives, especially when many other demands, people and institutions would clamor for our, our attention, our work, our allegiance. None of this is easy. Christians, have been lulled into complacency in modern times, just as they were in the first century. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, Germany's Third Reich in World War II, for example, built on the church's basic teaching of obedience. People were lulled into complacency, and in that complacency, they stopped somehow doing the Christian work of discerning the difference between good and evil and devoting their very lives to the good. Although I will say one of my favorite saints, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was quite the example for the church in that time. Paul warned against spiritual lassitude or laziness as a response to trying times. Brothers and sisters, he said, do not tire, do not weary of doing what is right. We do live in very distressing times, that is true. But so have many before us. The scripture for today reminds us to attend to the important things in life and remember the demands of justice and the invitation to a radical love and giving up ourselves, our lives, our wisdom, our works, and our wealth to participating in the inbreaking of the kingdom of God right here and right now. None of us, none of this is to say that we cannot take care of ourselves too. We must take time to rest and practice Sabbath, to pray to draw close to God, to be able to discern those things that are right, and in order to keep our hearts soft and alive to the God presence among us. In this way, we can live without anxiety, with the confidence of Christianity, 
trusting that our words and actions will be the necessary ones for today's chaotic, violent, and strife-torn words. World. So brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the words of St. Paul. Do not tire of doing what is right. Amen. Professing our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are form one, and they are found on page 383 of the Book of Common Prayer. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the world for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all people, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. For this city, for every city and community, And for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord that we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord in the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. in heaven and earth. Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, prayer people. So glad to have you guys all back. Feels like old times. Oh, God. Peace, peace. You doing okay? Okay. <laughs> peace, everybody. Um, the instructions for Eucharist are in your bulletin, so I'm not going to repeat them. Um, but right now, when we sometimes have announcements, we are going to have another one of our moments of witness um, from people in the parish to whom this church has meant so much and the presence of Christ in their lives has been such a strong guiding force. That's probably all of you, but I couldn't fit all of you in on every single Sunday. So today, I'd like to invite Terry Blackwell up. Good morning, I'm Terry Blackwell, and Kristen asked me to tell you what it is, why I love Epiphany. So after much thought, this is what it is. My most favorite times of the church year are Christmas and Easter, with the acolytes' grand procession. They enter carrying the kites, the cross, the torches, the banners, sometimes a second cross, and sometimes a second set of torches. That grand procession affects many people. We often have graduated acolytes who attend those services and have remarked to me that they can remember their role in that grand procession. The grand procession at this church began for me when my parents took me to Lakeside Elementary School as an infant, where the Church of the Epiphany met before we built the parish hall and before the building that we're now in. My dad taught Sunday school, 
middle school, high school, for many years. He coordinated the Vacation Bible School. And he also hid eggs at the East Fair Trunk, really hid them. So he had to help the kids find them when they couldn't. Dad meant a lot to younger people. He would often seek out that person, that young adult at the coffee hour, who seemed to be standing alone that no one was talking to, and always made them feel welcome. My mom was God's handmaiden. She was a member of the Alta Guild, and later became chairman of the Alta Guild. Often took me with her to polish all this brass before while she's arranging flowers. Mom would tell me, we're preparing the church for God's guests on Sunday, so everything has to be perfect. No finger marks on the brass, no stains on the fair linen. Everything has to be perfect. We're preparing God's place. Mom later served on the committee that chose the stained glass windows and collected the material for the pall that was on her coffin. So my sister and I, when we come in the door, we see our parents every time we come in. But there are other people I see in that procession. There's Pete Gretz, who gave the grand piano that Anita is now going to play this morning. It used to be in the parish hall. He played for the children's church services. It's over here now. There was Mrs. Cook in the Elmore's who sat behind me in church. When they parents died, they gave the, the Noah's Ark window that you see when you go in and out. There was Mr. Wynn and Pete Whitlock, who cared for the ground diligently. His wife, uh, Juliet, served as a church secretary for many, many years. There's Sandra Hampton, who began the tradition of arranging the flowers that you'll see at, at Christmas and the, and the lilies that are here at Easter. She started that and was a very good floral arranger. Nadine Michael served as church hostess for many years and made sure we had the most perfect reception over in the parish hall whenever there was a, a bishop's visit or a, a special event. We had Tyria Sexton who would make special tea on Christmas Eve and serve it to the parishioners. There was John Joystead who taught me Sunday school in high school and middle school. He gave, taught me all the symbols of the church. So I know what the paschal candle means, the missile stand, the purificators, the birth, the veil, all of it. I was most grateful to his, his teaching. There was Tilly Freed, who used to sit over here and always remind us of the lamb's basket that she helped coordinate. Mel Evans, who was served, I guess you could say Gray, maybe his would be Mel's replacement. <coughs> But Mel had his wife, Hazel, and they loved the beach, and they would go in the summer down to the Myrtle Beach all the time. He gave the parlor that you see with the shells and the picture of the scene of the water and all in Hazel's memory, as well as the bell tower out by the, the memorial garden. There was Joyce Whitlock, who later took over the, the kitchen and made sure our funeral receptions and everything were just right, and always worried if we had enough food. She told me, remember, we've got to feed the people first. So if you bring dessert, that's okay, but first we've got to feed the people. So get those finger sandwiches in you. Then I'll end with Bubba Wama, who coordinated our acolytes for many years. He organized them in a way that they hadn't been organized before. He impressed on them that they needed to buy their own things. He had fundraisers. He had slave markets where they would auction off their help to other people who wanted it in the church. He had car washes and was able to buy, they bought those first two set of porches that you see here. The acolytes purchased those with their money they raised. They also bought their own cloth, gloves, and crosses and the colored rope that they wear to indicate the changing of the season. 
And Baba would use those robes to teach them how to read the church calendar, to know what colors meant and when they had to change colors and why. Later, when I had to act like we, we fundraised again using the flocking plan. We sold flock insurance. We paid flock insurance to keep pink flamingos out of your yard. <laughs> we bought the second set of torches because we had so many acolytes we needed another set of torches. So these are just a few of the people. There are many more people that I remember and I could remember where they all sat in church. So all my life I have watched this grand procession. People passing the cross and the torch to others and we pick up that torch and using our talent and their gifts, we move forward to express God's love. It's remarkable. And I love you all for being in that grand procession. God bless. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Amen. 